another of the post-coronavirus lectures on sociological theory. Uh, this is on Marzell Mauss's The Gift. Um, and, and this is a book I teach to my uh, graduate uh, sociological theory class, my classical uh, sociological theory class. Um, and the book that we're using is a 2011 reprint of the... Um, you know, the Free Press 1954 translation. This book is everywhere. You should be able to find it free online if you didn't want to order it. Um, you know, I should sort of just glance at my copy. I mean, there are a few books that I own that have been written over uh, with more different colors of ink and, and different periods of time uh, than this book. And um, it's just, uh, it seems to me to be sort of a perpetual source of, of inspiration. There are some sociologists I seem to dim uh, every time I reread them. They seem to get duller and duller. Um, but Maus isn't one of those uh, uh, authors. He, he just really seems to capture a really important uh, feature of the social world in, 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 in very brief passages. He has an eye for good examples. And, and um, um, again, he's very persuasive. So he's, he is one of the um, uh, younger Durkheimians. So... Um, this book was published in 1926. Durkheim himself had died, uh, you know, uh, during the, uh, the Great War. Uh, Maus um, is Durkheim's nephew, so uh, he, was a, he was actually a family member as well as being a, um, um, you know, one of, one of Durkheim's sort of star students. Um, you know, Durkheim lost many of his sort of immediate uh, uh, round of students, including uh, his son during World War I. And, and you know, Maus makes reference, um, really, it's on page uh, eight of the book, um, to the scholar uh, Robert Hertz, uh, who apparently, as he says, left behind the following note uh, about the spirit of the gift, which turns out to be one of the key sort of... Um, uh, concepts to the book, right? And so that he, so so Miles is careful to attribute the sort of founding idea about the how or the spirit of the gift uh, to his um, to his uh, you know to his deceased colleague Robert Hertz, you know this young man uh, who I believe died you know in his early twenties or mid twenties uh, in um, in 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 the First World War. Um, so I think what I want to do, let's just sort of try to get into the logic of the book. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll work through some of the things that I think are most important about the book. And then we'll sort of wrap up with a kind of a quick move through it. Um, but I'm going to try to use some illustrations and some examples. Um, and some that are kind of familiar to me, they might be to you as well. Uh, whenever I teach the book, I always think of, of O. Henry's uh, short story, The Gift of the Magi. Uh, it's a book that I read in high school. Or excuse me, short story I read in high school. I still remember the thing. Um, and I, I haven't read it recently, but but it, but my recollection is that there's a young sort of married couple, impecunious, right? They're they're they're, they're short on money, um, and it's Christmas time, and so they're giving each other a gift. If I got this wrong, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, each of them has sort of a feature or an object uh, that is very close to their heart, and that the other really likes and admires about them. Um, so the wife uh, loves his watch, thinks he's got a great watch, and she loves her own hair, whereas uh, the husband loves her hair and, uh, and also his watch. So they don't have money, and so Christmas is coming, and you probably know how the story goes. So each of these, this, this, this pair, um, sells the thing that matters most to them in order to purchase a gift uh, to augment the thing that matters most uh, to their partner. So the wife cuts and sells her hair and then buys a watch chain uh, for the husband. And the husband uh, sells his watch in order to buy combs uh, for her long hair. So, uh, so after the gifts are exchanged, uh, the wife receives the, uh, this beautiful comb and has no hair with which to comb it. And the husband receives a watch chain and has no chain, uh, excuse me, no watch to hang upon it. So, uh, so each of them makes this significant sacrifice to something that really matters to them. Um, and then they wind up exchange, you know, uh, giving up the thing that they most want uh, or, or most love about themselves to buy a gift to augment the thing uh, that they most love about the other. And then that each of them has sacrificed the thing that the gift meant to, was meant to augment. 
So if you only look at this exchange, this short story, from a material standpoint, right? Each of them has has sacrificed something important to them, has gotten back nothing useful, right? A, a comb doesn't help when you have no hair, and a watch chain is useless if you have no watch. So 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 they seem to have really suffered a loss. But you know, the short story ends with a kind of celebration of love, right? Because in the end, Although each lost something that mattered to them, what they gained was a realization, a kind of crystallization, a kind of visualization, right, of the symbolic tie between them, that the love was made manifest in these useless gifts. And of course, all gifts that really mean something are often quite useless, right? Um, and so more on that as we go. What I think is interesting about that story is that is that each of the members of this couple met all three of the obligations, the ritual obligations associated with the gift, according to Mao's. And so, uh, and, and they happen here all in one throw. So one of the things that Mao's makes a big deal about is that in the system of gift exchanges that he analyzes, most of the time there are uh, extensive passages of time um, separating the uh, giving of the gift uh, from the receipt, you know, for the, the obligation to give, the obligation to receive, and the obligation to return are separated in time. Here they're all taking place in one throw. So, uh, so yeah, the three obligations, the obligation to give, right? And it was Christmas, young couple married, each of them had better have a gift for the other, so there's an obligation to give, an obligation to receive, you can't reject the gift given, um, and then you have an obligation to make worthy returns. So the each of the parties had better give a gift equal to uh, the worth of the gift that was given by their partner, lest the relationship is damaged or, uh, or even broken. So the gift exchange ultimately, uh, again, so, so the hair is sacrificed uh, in order to give a watch chain. The watch chain is, uh, the watch is sacrificed to give combs, right? And so these gifts are exchanged and what you've done is made visible the social ties between uh, these two young people. Their love has been made real. So the obligation to give, the obligation to receive, and the obligation to make worthy return is uh, all those three obligations were met in O. Henry's short story. So, you know, the New Yorker in 2017 did this funny little uh, piece on the short story, uh, and they start, talked about different versions of the story that failed. Um, and it was just sort of a funny set of jokes, but, but one version of the story that would have failed is if the man sold the wife's hair to buy a watch chain himself, right? So if the man had actually just cut her hair and got the watch chain, they'd still be in more or less the same um, material position, but it would have been a kind of theft on his part of her thing, and it would have been a realization of the love relationship, right? Uh, the uh, man with lots of money buys combs, and a wife with lots of money buys a watch chain. Okay, now in that situation, there's no sacrifice, right? Each of them has plenty of money, so no sacrifice is made, and the gifts aren't actually visualizing the depth of the love that these uh, really deeply sacrificial but useless gifts uh, mean. The third variant was the wife sells uh, her hair, uh, you know, to buy an expensive watch chain, and the husband gives her a really cheap alarm clock, right? In that situation, um, there was an obligation to give on each part, and an obligation to receive, but the worthy return was broken, right? So, so in each of these different variants, either the obligation to give, receive, or make worthy return was broken. And the reason that the O. Henry story is so moving is that the uselessness of the gift uh, was completely beside the point, right? You're not giving a commodity, you're giving a gift. And a gift is a signifier a signifier of a social relationship, right? That sets up a kind of ritual expectation for, you know, giving, receiving, and, and worthy return. So that's a beginning uh, to the book. All right, so let's try to look at this uh, in another way. So when I teach the book, I, I just did it last week, uh, you know, I was joking with one of my students that if there was a bumper sticker, uh, there'd probably be several of them for this book. Um, one bumper sticker for this book would be gifts are shuttles. And I actually think that that, in the end, is really the skeleton key to this book. Like, if you were to know one idea, um, the basic idea is that a gift is a shuttle. And that comes from page 19 in the book. Um, and when a... Um, do I have it written down? I do not. So we'll just take a look at page 19. Yeah. So there's a quote here from, a, um, from New Caledonia. 
and a, uh, I, I believe it's a woman, who is um, describing uh, the gift exchange and, and says, look, our feasts are the movement of the needle which sews together the parts of our reed roofs, making them a single roof, one single word. The same things, the same thread returns, uh, right? So the idea is, is that as the gift is exchanged back and forth, it actually welds together the society uh, with solidarity. So gifts are shuttles moving back and forth between members of a society. Now, I actually like that idea of the thread being attached, and I actually like the idea of sewing here because I think, again, this is a binding agent, just like in weaving. So, you know, weaving, uh, a widely used uh, mechanism of, uh, of, of cloth making, um, something that uh, has been part of humanity since time out of mind. Somewhere here I have images of, of um, <laughs> which, which I now cannot locate. I have images here of, of, uh, of shuttles. Um, which I can't, <laughs> this always happens. This is embarrassing, um, when this does happen, but here we go. Um, oh, sakes. it's going to show just as I give up looking as usual. Um, well, this little drawing will have to suffice then. So, um, imagine that this is a loom. I actually had pictures of loom with shuttles in them, which would make it uh, easier to see, but imagine that this is a loom. So these are the warp, uh, threads, right? Um, and then the, th uh, so, so which are either attached, you know, usually like to, let's say that they're attached up here to a branch or to a, uh, a board. And then at the bottom of the threads hangs weights. That's to be a weighted, uh, um, a weighted warp loom, a very old system. So the warp, the vertical threads are held taut. And then a, you're moving the horizontal thread, the weft back and forth, uh, between, um, the warp. Well, you know, what a loom does is it actually separates half of the warp threads um, into two different planes. It's called, it creates a shed uh, in between them. Um, and then in between, as the shed is created, the, uh, the shuttle is passed back and forth. Now, if you've ever tried to push thread or push a rope, you know, it doesn't work very well, right? So what a shuttle does, it allows for thread uh, or rope to be pushed, right? You can be pushed. So the shuttle is literally thrown back and forth. And as the shuttle is thrown back and forth, it trails the thread, which creates the fill, the weft of, of the cloth, right? And then, and then each, after each pass, the, uh, the loom is, is uh, usually petals that shift it. And then you, the, the, you know, the, the, the warps uh, inter, interweave the other direction. And then you pass the shuttle back through. So I'm not doing a very good job. But, but so as the warp, warps move back and forth, the shuttle is moved back and forth, thrown back and forth, and it trails the thread behind it, making the cloth. The gift is a shuttle. So when a gift is given, there is a material object like a shuttle that moves back and forth between members of a, of a society who are in relationship to each other. But it isn't the passage of the material object that really matters here. It isn't the, it isn't the, 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 the object as commodity. Instead, the gift is something that is a signifier of a social relationship. So what is trailed behind the gift is, is, um, is, a, is a marker of relationship, a symbolic representation of relationship. So, you know, if society is actually a system, in, in my writing, I always refer to it as, as a structural system of language uh, and law, names and norms. Uh, it, let's say that each of those are, are, are half of the plane of the uh, warp of society. Then the shuttle moving back and forth is, you know, a kind of the, the, the uh, social relations that are welded together uh, in the uh, structural system of the society, right? So, so a long-winded way to say that the gifts themselves don't really matter. What matters is the social relationship that is bonded together through the passage of the gift back and forth, okay? All right, so a bit, little bit more. Gifts, so another, another potential bumper sticker. Gifts are moral objects. They're things that are doubled. So, you know, in, in Durkheim's great work, uh, Division of Labor, um, in, 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 in Suicide, um, in the um, Rules of Sociological Method, you know, Weber refers to uh, human beings as being doubled. We're body and soul. We're individual consciousness and collective consciousness. We are... Um, you know, private self and collective self, something along those lines, where we're both private and social. Well, gifts are moral objects. That means that they are always, always social. 
So they're doubled things, body and soul. The soul of the gift is realized upon worthy return. That's on page nine. So, um, so we've already mentioned this, that what, um, what Hertz found, um, had discovered, is the how of the gift, or the spirit of the gift. So the spirit of the gift is, is, is a, um, again, uh, when you give a gift back and forth, it isn't bargained over. That's the first big idea that's going to keep coming up, all right? You can still see my margin notes. Good God, this is just like Hegel and Marx on commodities, right? And um, so I give a thing to a third person who after time decides to give me something in repaying payment for it. And he makes me a present of something. Now this uh, gift then I receive from him is the spirit of the first gift. In other words, um, in, just like in Marx, where the value of a commodity isn't realized, isn't made real, it's potential, but it's made real upon exchange, right? And so that the value of a commodity is realized in the form of either money or another commodity. What this um, a tribal person, and Maori is saying, is that the spirit of a gift is realized in the return of, the worthy return of another gift, right? And if a worthy return is not made, the spirit of the first gift that is given will haunt the receiver. And so, it, so, so there is a kind of moral binding agent that this is, that, that the rules of gift are social facts that impress down upon members of a society that are, um, you know, that are determinant uh, of them. They, they, they're, they're compelling. They must uh, be behave, or they must be followed, right? Okay, so the, so the gift that I receive on account of the gift that came from you, I must return to you. It would not be right on my part to keep these gifts, whether they were desirable or not. I must give them to you um, since they are the how of the gift which you gave me. If I were to keep the second gift for myself, I might become ill or even die. Such is how. The how of personal property, the how of the gift, the how of the forest. Enough on that subject. So there it is. So, so as gifts are given back and forth, it, it, again, the way I tell my students is literally to imagine um, that there is something like, 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 like gifts are amulets that have something like a demon or a spirit uh, embedded within them. Uh, you know, think of like like all of the uh, you know the Aladdin's tales of, um, of of the genie and the lamp. You know, there's actually a, a genie, a demon inside of a lamp. When you stroke the lamp, out comes the genie, who then uh, you know grants you wishes or something. Well, well, imagine that 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 gifts are like that lamp that's passed back and forth, and you don't have a genie that grants wishes. You have a genie that enforces the three rules of obligation of gifts. The, the obligation to give, to receive, and to make worthy return, okay? So gifts are dangerous things. So if you receive a gift and you do not make worthy return, right, um, um, you're in trouble, right? So, so gifts are moral objects. They're doubled things, body and soul. The soul of the gift is realized upon worthy return, page nine. So worth, again, we've used this term before when we covered marks. Worth refers to value, value vert, right? And it really refers to, uh, uh, you know, val, fall, human life, right? death. So to make worthy return is to have commensurate amount of sacrifice that goes into the construction of the gift. And, um, you know, it, it has to be somewhat commensurate, right? In fact, worthy return requires a surplus. More on that as you go along. So in other words, you can't give the exact same gift back. Well, you could, but, but, but there usually is a surplus involved, right? So the body of the gift is the material object that you give. The soul of the gift is the how, H-A-U, the obligation to make worthy return. And if the worthy return isn't made, you will be haunted, you'll be damaged, you may be killed by the soul of the gift, right? You must return it uh, or, or, or be damaged, okay? Yeah, so there they are. So gifts are dangerous things. The how of the gift avenges the failure to meet the moral obligations of the gift. This is on page 10 and 11 of the book, okay? So what are the three moral obligations of the gift? Again, uh, they, again, this is talked about on page 10 to 11. Great uh, uh, detail, page 37 to 43. The three obligations, the obligation to give, right? So gifts are never uh, interpersonal. They're always involve the mediating third of society, right? They're never just singular to singular, but they always involve the particularity of the society in which you're involved, right? 
So you have an obligation to give. This is a social moral obligation, not just something between two people. You have an obligation to receive. If you, if you fail to receive or reject a gift that's given, it's almost always a fundamental breach of a relationship. Then the how of the gift that's given is going to attack the, the person who refuses to receive the gift. And then you have the obligation uh, to make worthy return. Okay? So on page 41, then, uh, the, the discussion of the person or the, or, or the community who cannot return a loan, which is a form of gift, or a potlitch, which we're going to talk about as a very specific system of gift giving. If a person or a community can't return a gift with worthy return, you lose rank and status, and you even stop being a free man or a free tribe, and you actually fall into some form of debt slavery. And, and in fact, this is a major way. So if you, if, you, if you find yourself in competitive gift giving, which is what the potlitch is, right? It's agonistic competitive gift, gift, gift giving. If you give, um, if you receive a gift or a system of gifts in the potlitch and you're unable to return that gift with interest, you're going to lose honor. Your face will lose weight, as Maus uh, says, and you may actually fall into slavery. So gift giving is a kind of warfare. Um, it's a warfare that's fought not with weapons, but rather with these material objects. And as the gifts are given, the stakes continue to increase, right? So you give, you must receive more back. You give more, you get more back again. You still have to give more, right? So it's kind of like, like, like the Soviet Union and the United States in the arms race in, in, you know, in the mid-20th century. You know, you were really trying to bankrupt each other. And that's what the potlitch ceremony is. It's a system of competitive gift giving. And the person who's unable to make worthy return, right, is the person who fails and who falls into debt slavery or the community of the tribe that's unable to make um, a worthy return, uh, you know, becomes essentially the slaves of the, of the, of the tribal people. Uh, you know, who, who, had, who had originally given, okay? So gifts create binding obligations. You know, in the language that on page 41, gifts put a thread on somebody. Uh, page 40, uh, gifts, you receive a gift, you receive a gift on your back. So yeah, so page 40 and 41, just some great quotes in here, again, from, um, from tribal respondents here, right? Yeah, the gift on the back. Um, gifts are always accepted and praised. You must speak your appreciation of food prepared for you, but you accept a challenge at the same time. So to accept a gift is to accept the challenge and the challenge is to return. So you receive a gift on the back, right? So you take the food, but you mean to take the challenge to prove that you are not unworthy, that you're able to return it with a surplus. The obligation to repay section on the obligation to make worthy return. Again, the debt slaves notion is, is just described on page 41. Again, if you can't make worthy return, you fall into slavery. But um, what the Haida say as if they had invented the Latin phrase independently, right, um, of nexum, um, that a girl's mother who gives a betrothal payment to the mother of a young chief puts a thread on it, right? So the gift puts a thread on it. So this idea that, that the giving of the gift establishes a moral obligation, a social bond, and it, it even, it, it, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a mechanism to place a symbolic relationship that's normally invisible in an imaginary form. It's tangible. It can be seen. It can be understood, right? So in the same way that I just made the argument a, a few minutes ago that gifts are shuttles that are passed back and forth in a loom, right? Because thread, remember thread can't be thrown, thread can't be pushed, and the, and the shuttle allows for the movement of the thread, for the thread to be pushed through. You know, um, social obligations can't be seen, um, and, 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 but, they become, but they can be realized, they can be made tangible uh, through gift giving, especially when the gift sets up this binding obligation uh, to make worthy return. So I tried to do a little drawing for you here of, of, of the gift on the back, right? You give the gift, you receive the gift, but this is a burden, right? You are encumbered with the obligation to make worthy return, right? And in general, in, the, in these gift societies that Miles writes about, these gift economies, you must receive, right? You have an obligation to receive. So this is a game you cannot refuse to play. You must play it right? You must engage in this challenge. 
and and so you have an obligation to receive a gift and then once you get it you've got to go off and work and and expend and make sacrifice of time and energy and resources in order to make a worthy return of that gift okay and then here's a little drawing of putting a thread on him so the mother of the uh, bride uh, gives the mother of the groom a little gift who then you know he gets it and now he has a thread placed upon him but the gift is binding it creates the obligation uh, you know to make the worthy return okay yeah so and, and another idea that comes up uh, in the book at several places is that the exchange of gifts and the exchange of commodities are distinct things okay so the gift economy and the economy of commodities uh, are distinct things and that uh, yeah so they're actually talked about on page 20 so um, yeah so among um, this is who are these people again this is among the Trobri Trobriand Islanders um, the Kula is the Grand Potlich it's the system of ritual gift exchange whereas the Gimvali is bargaining for commodities right so in the same way that you know that medieval car uh, carnivals or, or festivals or even feast days or um, you know even solemn occasions often had a side activity of a market for selling trinkets and goods and, and spices and that kind of thing. So too do most of these potlatch ceremonies or ritual gift exchanges that which have a kind of sacred flavor to them also accomp accompanying that sacred exchange of gifts is a second market uh, that th this gimvali which is the exchange of useful commodities that involve bargaining. So this theme here is that when you're exchanging gifts, there can be no bargaining. The gift is given, and you have an obligation to receive it, and you have an obligation to make worthy return. There can be no bargaining, right? So if at any, at the moment you begin bargaining, you drop out of the gift exchange uh, uh, system, you actually drop out of sacredness, and you're now in a profane world of simple commodity uh, exchange relations, right? So, so uh, gifts cannot be uh, bargained, okay? So another big idea here, all right. Okay, so we have a, a double, uh, you know, gifts that are doubled. Um, you know, I've written about this in, in, in a piece I did with, um, with my colleague Mark Worrell a few years ago, um, Atopia Awaits a Critical Sociological Analysis of Marx's Political Imaginary. Um, I'm not sure if we have to go into all of that right here, but it really has a long section uh, dealing with Mao's. Mao's was very important uh, for the way that this article uh, unfolded. But I distinguish between uh, here these two kinds of markets. I call them, I'm using Lacan's language, we have two, one market, market small a or petty a, to use the term uh, from Lacan. So this would be the mar market of commodities. This is a profane market um, where you're exchanging goods and you're engaged in bargaining. So you're not treating anything or anyone as sacred. You're just engaging in a profane, touchable relation of, of exchange of useful things. Nothing sacred here. But the gift exchange um, is market big A. And so that would be like the potlatch ceremony or what he calls the system of total prestation, uh, total gift giving, giving, more on that in just a minute. And so in those kind of systems, yeah, um, just read this. In tribal and archaic society, exchanges of commodities and exchanges of gifts were kept socially distinct. Markets for commodities, exchangeable use values, occurred alongside of and underneath ritual gift exchanges, um, symbolic ritual objects without use value, right? So you know you have a gift when it has no use to you, right? When it doesn't do anything for you, right? You've got a gift when there's no use value, but where the exchange, uh, again, sort of realizes or makes real a social relationship of some kind. You know you have a commodity when there's nothing sacred at all, right? When you can bargain. So, so you have two exchanges of, of moral objects side by side, commodities and gifts, right? And so there it is. So, so the uh, alongside of and underneath ritual gift exchange, symbolic ritual objects without use value, uh, each with distinctive objects, partners, rules of trade, positioning within the symbolic order, you know, the, the obligation to give, receive, and so on, right? Uh, and alongside of that then exists production and exchange of commodities. So everyday useful objects exchange through barter, um, and, and, and haggling and that kind of thing, uh, a, a profane market, a market small a, right? And then along with that then is this production of ritual exchange of, of these um, 
uh, deeply meaningful, sacred, symbolic objects, gifts, sacrifice, ritual offerings, uh, and sacred ceremonies, right? And so that's, that's, that's big on, right? So yeah, uh, here's a section just to, just to get that idea of the gift on its back and, and, and the warp and the weft of the thread. So this comes from Melanesia, right? So this is a, this, I'm, I'm quoting here. Um, I'll try to make it a little bit bigger for you, but I'm, I'm quoting here uh, across some text in, in uh, Mao's books. This is from page 19. Again, about that, about the symbolic social function of gift ceremony is, a, is akin to the movement of a needle which sews together the parts of reed ropes, making them a single rope. Remember, you can't, you can't push thread through cloth. So if you're going to sew cloth, you need a thing that allows the thread to move. You can't make visible social relationships very easily. So the gift is a way to make, to, to make it possible to sort of push and pull on social relations, right? It's a way to realize social relations, to get a handle on them in some way, right? To grasp them in some way, to make them graspable, right? That's what the gift does. It makes a social relation graspable. You can see, you can grab hold of it, right? All right. Um, so like the shuttle on, on a loom that weaves by passing to and fro, depositing a weft thread across the warp, the give and take of gift rituals generates collective effervescence, right? The collective fever of 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 um, of, um, of solidarity, right? Um, while structuring its alienation and projection, right? Realizing the symbolic order. So you pass these things back and forth, and you create society, right? The object comes and goes. It isn't society, but is the thing that allows for the members of a society to grab hold of it, to grasp the society. And, and it, it realizes it, makes it real, right? All right, so, um, yeah, so the exchange of moral objects both binds together while creating bondage. Uh, they generate obligations, for example, on receiving a gift on your back, that's at page 40, or when a gift from a mother-in-law puts a threat on the suitor, that's page 41, and failing to fulfill the obligation where the return leads to the loss of status, dishonor, warfare, and enslavement. So I know I'm being a little repetitive here, but these are really important passages um, uh, in the book. Okay, so um, yeah, so that was the Trobriander's uh, distinction of these two kinds of markets. Um, I may have to raise this back up again for you. Um, okay. So yeah, so there it is. You receive the gift on the back, right? And that puts a thread on the receiver. Okay. Okay, so individuals buy and sell and bargain for commodities and markets, but it is groups, not individuals, is a quote from, from, from Mao's, who exchange gifts and the moral obligations associated with gifts. So these are moral persons, not individuals. By moral person, it's a person who's acting essentially in the name of, who's a personification of the group themselves, right? So when you're, we're an agent of society, you're a moral person, right? So it's not just objects, but exchange of courtesies, entertainment, ritual, military assistance, women, children, dances, feasts. Um, you know, they all appear voluntary, but are in fact strictly obligatory, and their sanction is generally warfare, right? So these are all important binding things. So again, gifts aren't free. There's no such thing as a free gift. Gifts set up these binding moral obligations. The violation of which is either the possession of bad fortune or of demonic uh, attack, right? It's like like the like the demon of vengeance or the demon, uh, you know, the, the vampire demon who comes after you uh, if you fail to avenge the death of, of 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 a loved one, something along those lines. So too, if you fail to pass on the gift and to return it, make worthy return then you basically, again, can die or you're going to receive warfare, which will, of course, kill you, right? So anyway, so gifts then are social facts. They're not an individual. They're social facts. They are part of the symbolic order and they are binding upon persons as a result. All right, so two kinds of gifts then. So, um, you know, Miles really isn't writing about individual gift giving. He's writing about socially patterned uh, gift giving and especially uh, gifts that become the primary structure of society itself. So he looks at those three societies, um, and they are Polynesia, Melanesia, and Northwest America, you know, the, the, the Pacific Northwest Indians, you know, the, the, the Native Americans of, of, of the totem pole uh, and the potlets, right? So these are societies that have what he calls a system of total prestation. So that means, that's a French word meaning essentially present or gift. So total gift. So like the entire society itself, the entire thing, the family, the um, power relations, authority relations, warfare, economic production, leisure time, 
work time, that all of the reg religion itself, that all of these regions of life can be reduced down to manifestations of gift giving. So, so his argument is very profound that many tribal societies are actually not systems of commodity exchange. They are instead systems of gift exchange. So gifts aren't just light things that are passed back and forth between, you know, uh, 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 you know, friends at Christmas time or birthdays or something like that. Gifts in traditional society, again, are morally binding objects that have the full tragic weight of, of um, you know, of society, you know, bearing down upon the individuals, right? If you fail to meet the moral obligations of a gift, you die, right? So... Societies that are structured then as systems of gift exchanges, these tribal societies, he calls systems of total prestation. And then the, that's on page three. And then on page four, is, and, and by the way, he used the term total institution. They're a total institution. They totally, they're a total phenomena. So the gift becomes a total phenomena that structures every other aspect of the society. So this is a term that the uh, theorist Irving Goffman takes over and uses in his famous book, Asylums, where he writes about you know, mental asylums and, and boot camps and convents and other places as total institutions where all of life is structured by uh, you know, the, the official order of, uh, of the institution. And here, the entire life is structured by the obligations, the total way of life of a group of people structured by the obligations of gift and uh, of gift giving. All right, so there's a, a special form of total prestation called the potlitch. And uh, this is on page four and five. It goes into quite a bit of detail about it. Um, okay, once you know, again, I keep misplacing my book. Um, but he, um, yeah, so, yeah, so this is the potlitch, right? So the term comes from, um, yeah, it, it, it originally meant, um, it's the Chinook word and originally meant, this is really important to nourish or to consume. Um, consume here means really to burn. So, um, you know, the great um, so sociologist, I mean, the amazing sociologist, um, you know, sort of psychoanalytically informed, um, had ties to, to Lacan, we won't talk about those, Georges Bataille, the French sociologist, mid 20th century sociologist. You know, the concept of consumption, of social consumption, is really crucial to him. And to him, consumption is, you know, warfare is consumption. These potlatch ceremonies are consumption. That when a society generates a surplus, um, in order to, to keep the society sort of tightly bonded, the, the surplus gets destroyed. And that's what a potlatch ceremony does. A potlatch ceremony enhances the sort of solidarity of a group by systematically destroying the surplus of the society, right? And then you, then the society is basically reset with the bonds uh, uh, tight again. There's much more to it than that, but, 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 um, but he uses the term consume. You just simply burn up. So the potluck ceremony is this amazing, uh, you know, Native American exchange structure where the entire surplus of a tribe is given to another tribe and essentially burned up in the process, right? Or thrown away in the process, those kinds of things, right? So it means to nourish or to consume. And the nourish thing is gonna be really important because what's being nourished is the social tie between the two groups and the way that it's often imagined among the groups of people in these societies is that what you're nourishing is a God. So you're really making a sacrifice to a God in the form of realizing the exchange rituals uh, to another, right? So these societies are very rich societies. Um, uh, they pass their winters a continuous festival. You know, uh, this is Franz Boas's work. Um, you know, where really about a third of the life of these societies was spent in their individual totems. So we've talked about totems already um, with Freud and with uh, Durkheim, uh, but these are images from Boas. Um, so, so this is some of the Northwest tribal Indians. So, so, so literally, they spend a third of their life um, living apart from their everyday family and living in totem structures. And these totem structures are really all about ritual exchange, you know, all kinds of incredibly elaborate dances. And you have to be a pretty well-to-do society to be able to dedicate the time and energy necessary, um, you know, to manufacturing these totem objects and then to reenacting um, dances and, and, and ceremonies um, in which you are possessed by the spirit of your totem animal, right? 
So, so these are really wealthy societies and the potlatch is just one part, um, probably the most decisive structuring part of this overall system uh, of exchange. This is a shaman or a shaman from, um, uh, from oh God, I can't remember if it's the Tinglet or, or, or the Haida, I'm not certain, but, but, but it's it, a shaman. So mystic trance, you know, um, um, so we're going to be talking about, you know, this possession of the spirit world and to come into possession of the spirit of the how or the spirit of the society um, requires something like a shaman. More on that in, in the Freud lecture on totem and taboo. Okay, so the cases then that, that Mao's uses are, are the three cases of Polynesia, Melanesia, and then these Northwest American Indians. And the potlatch ceremony then is a very special form of total prestation, right? But it's one that is, um, right, that has rivalry. And uh, so, it's, it, and it's usur us usurious, right? Like, like loans, right? So there's interest involved here that when you give things away, you're expecting it to come back to you with a benefit, right? With, a, with, with interest involved. So these purely sumptuous destruction of accumulated wealth in order to eclipse a, a, a rival chief, right? So, you know, there's that famous line that, you know, what do, um, you know, that in the, in the later part of the 19th century, the British aristocrats were no longer necessary to the political and economic order. They were no longer even important militarily. So what did they do? They essentially grew mustaches and, and, and sideburns at each other. And in these groups, um, warfare is set aside and uh, there's, there's an economic surplus. So what do you do with your time? You essentially throw parties at each other, these potlatch ceremonies, a spirit of rivalry and antagonism. So, the, so there it is. So this agonistic type, agonistic, this essentially competitive uh, form of total prestation is the potlatch. All right, so, so that's it. So the potlatch is this world that's structured, that's held together by an agonistic exchange of gifts. So the, always a goal, and so the goal is to basically put gifts on the back of the recipient so that they have to return the gifts to you with a, with a surplus, right? And then if they can't do it, they essentially become uh, debt slaves of your group, right? So, so that's the potlatch. So again, this becomes something that totally organizes uh, a society, right? And so the idea is, is you can you can see this right. This is Bataille, basically, right? That that um, that because you are throwing away your surplus, you can never become a leisure society. Instead, this the society. So, excuse me. Because you're never sort of living off of your surplus, but destroying it, you can't relax into a leisure society. Instead, you're going to have to sort of always be on your toes, and everyone is sort of going to have to be stitched in to a kind of system of production, a ritual production system. Uh, to make certain that the potlatch can be returned worthily in, in a worthy fashion in the following year. So the potlatch system generates tight bonding, right? Tight social bonding because the members of the society that are engaged in the potlatch can't relax, right? They can't drop out of the collective uh, consciousness and drop into individual consciousness. Instead, they must essentially stay in their um, moral person engaged in the production of, 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 of gifts for the potlatch exchange, right? So that means that you become bonded together 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the entire year, not in order to produce the economic goods for survival, but once that work is done, then you have this additional burden of producing the gifts to be given and destroyed in the next potlatch ceremony. And so this apparently completely irrational system of exchange, nevertheless, keeps the society on its toes, keeps the social bonds uh, taut, uh, and, and, and kind of keeps the members of the society embedded, uh, installed, uh, energized uh, by the social structure, the symbolic structure in which, they're, uh, in which they operate. Okay, so this is a big part of the book right there. All right. Other ideas, and we're almost out of these. We can get into the book in a little bit more detail. Uh, page one, uh, 134, oh, excuse me, 13 to 14, sorry. Uh, he writes about the gift logic being um, the equivalent of the sacrifice to gods, okay? That they have the same structure. So um, one, uh, you know, there, there are many, uh, you know, Mao's and, and Uber and, and other, um, 
of uh, the fellow travelers of Durkheim wrote about sacrifice, the nature and function of sacrifice. Uh, Mao's wrote a book on a general theory of magic. He wrote a book on prayer, um, which is very interesting. But um, but but these books uh, again are, are 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 finding a kind of commonality that in primitive society, a term that's really not meant as a pejorative, but is simply talking about um, you know primary forms of society that have relatively um, low levels of, of economic value of commodities and capital, but instead are really have very high levels of values where much of the life is led ritually and in ritual exchange and that kind of thing, right? That those kind of primitive societies, right, often have a gift logic and they also have a sacrifice logic. And his argument is, is that the sacrifice to gods is a gift, right? And so he makes this argument, again, it's on 13 to 14, um, that um, when one prays, it's in the book on prayer, that when one prays or when one gives um, uh, a gift to gods, right, you're trying to trigger the obligation to make worthy return. So those three, again, um, uh, obligations of gift, the obligation to give, the obligation to receive, and the obligation to make worthy return is essentially... Um, played backwards by members of a society in religious ritual, such that anticipating the obligation to make worthy return, the members of the society will worship. So here's our words, sacrifice, pray, tithe, worship, right? S uh, serve, wait upon, um, you know, the, um, the God, the collective representation, right? In order to bind the God, I mean, at least in the idea, in order to bind the God in the obligation, since the God has the obligation to receive the gift that is freely given, then there, the God then has the obligation to make worthy return. So in this little society, try to draw here the, the, the members of the society um, sacrifice goats or uh, grains of grass or the first uh, born kittens or something um, uh, and burn it up to the God thing. Uh, represented here by this sort of uh, big bird totem, and and then the they're saying make it rain, oh fetish, and the fetish then uh, makes it rain, right? And at least that's the idea. So 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 in order to get the god thing, the spirit power, to do something, you manipulate that thing uh, into giving you a worthy return by feeding it, by giving something to it that it has the obligation. Uh, to receive, right? And then as Miles writes, um, and as Durkheim writes, that what religion is then in many ways is a ritualization of this system of gift exchange, right? So if in some societies there's a potlet structure, and in some societies there's a total prestation structure, in most primitive societies there's actually a sacrifice structure, and that's in the end what religion is. Religion is a system of ritualized, institutionalized sacrifice, where you're giving gifts to the, represent, the collective representation uh, to your God in exchange for that God's protection or the delivering of benefit or something along those lines. And then at, at the level of magic, which he doesn't write much about here, but in magic, magic is, uh, where, ma magic is where the individual, uh, a, as a client, approaches the service professional, the magician, in order for that service professional to fuss with the spirit world for material benefit. Same thing. So you give a gift, you give something to the magician, and the magician feeds something up to the spirit world, but then kicks back um, uh, what, what one is wanted, right? So you make a kind of payment in exchange uh, for goods delivered or services rendered. Okay, so, so, so religion then takes the form of, of, this, of, of gift giving. And, you know, I'm, I, I was raised Catholic, I was an altar boy, and, and um, you know, in the Catholic Mass, there's that moment uh, prior to, uh, it's always prior to um, the uh, Eucharistic prayer, w which is the moment of transubstantiation when the bread is turned into, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the um, a portion of the body of Jesus, and then fed to in in, in a totem meal, fed to the members of the uh, of the of, of the congregation. Before that happens, before that gift of God, that gift of grace is given to the congregation. The congregation gives its gift and makes petitions and 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 um, asks, makes prayers. Uh, so there's a gift that's given, money, right? 
placed in a little basket and it goes and feeds to God. It isn't burned. Instead, it's put in a bank account somewhere. And, and, and so you've given this gift and then you make prayers or petitions, right? And so you make an offering, you offer, you make an offering to the God and then you petition, you pray for what you want and then you receive back grace, right? That you receive back the body of, of, of Christ in, in, in a way that can get inside of you, thus infusing you with God's grace and hopefully if all is well, your prayers will be answered. So even the ritual structure of contemporary Catholicism has that gift logic to it, right? You contribute, you tithe, you make payment, and then in exchange, you essentially bind the God uh, to worthy return, right? So many of the of the um, the contemporary, you know, gospel of health and wealth churches make this argument, right? That if you tithe to our church, you will get worthy return, right? You'll get it back with interest, right? So don't invest in the stock market, invest in the church, God will give you interest, right? The whole thing is a gift logic. I give something to the God, a tithe, and that binds the God to receive and then to make a worthy return, which is what the benefit I'm going to get, right? Health and wealth. Okay, so the structure of gift exchanges is our next, if I, again, if I were to have another bumper sticker, it would be, the, the, this would simply be the bumper sticker that said, um, it's content, not, uh, not content, but structure. It is symbolic structure, not content that matters. So it is the structure of gift exchange that matters. It is the social relationships that are made real or realized or become graspable through gift exchange that matter. It isn't the material, you know, utility of the gift. And, you know, as grandma used to say, it's the thought that matters, right? It isn't the gift itself, the material object. In fact, a useless gift um, can be the most meaningful, right? Um, uh, something like a wedding ring or a diamond or a, uh, um, you know, some other purely symbolic gift that has a lot of cost but no, no actual utility often makes a perfect gift because it's a sacrifice that signifies the relationship itself. So the structure of gift exchange realizes social relationships, sets up obligations. It's a social fact that's binding upon individuals. So it isn't the content of the gift. It isn't the body of the gift. It's the spirit of the gift uh, uh, that matters, right? So this is Durkheim and Marx. The big idea here is if you defetishize a commodity, Marx says, what you get is the dead labor of its production. If you defetishize a gift, Mouse says, what you get is a set of obligations, the right to receive, the right to exchange, and the right to make, and the obligation to make, the obligation to give, receive, and to make worthy return. And that is actually a society that, which, that if you defetishize a gift, you drop its content and realize its spirit, what you realize are social relations, okay? So let's see if we can't uh, uh, make that clean um, with two examples, okay? So the first one is, is um, I'm going to use my daughter's toys again, all right? So um, I'm going to use her toys, and we're going to bond together a group of individuals uh, with a gift. And so um, I could probably raise this up so that we can get more of the little rats uh, on, on the uh, screen. Okay, so here's our member, members of a society, or, or imagine that each one of these uh, little people represents a different a totem in a uh, you know in a totemic uh, tribal uh, society or clan society. So you know there's all kinds of ritual exchanges that go on. Each of them holds a potlatch or something like that. Okay. So the valued object that is being exchanged, the ritual that's being exchanged, is this. Um, uh, uh, as as all tribal people do, what you really want is a pink skateboard. Okay, so I have the, the ritual object that's going to be exchanged, the gift, and then I'm trailing behind the gift a really knotted up and not very clean uh, piece of yarn. That's going to represent the how of the gift or the, the, uh, the bonds, the social relations. So what we're going to try to do is not just pass the gift around, but we're going to try to uh, make visible the social relations uh, that the gift um you know, uh, uh, realizes and bonds together. Okay, so let's say that the gift begins with um, uh, the little pumpkin girl here. Okay, so the pumpkin girl has the gift and she gives the gift to uh, the little, um, you know, Burberry wearing um, uh, girl 
here. So she she and she she now has the gift. She doesn't keep it. She passes the ritual pink um, skateboard on to the little ballerina who doesn't keep it. She passes it on to the um, to the um, girl dressed as a hippie who passes it on to Leopard Boy who then passes it on to Little Lord Fauntleroy here. Okay, so what we have done is essentially uh, the gift has been passed around. Oh yeah, and then let's say that Little Lord, that, li that Little Green Boy, we'll just call him Little Green Boy here, passes it back to the original uh, gift giver, thus returning the how of the gift. Okay, so the how of the gift, the spirit of the gift has been realized in the return of the gift. Okay, so what have we done? If this has worked right, we have basically welded together everybody except the one who was afraid of the rain. Anyway, she apparently, this girl did not make worthy return. She has now died. Okay, so she's gone. But everybody else in this society has made worthy return and they're bonded together into a moral community. So this is the gift. The gift is gone, right? So the gift has been passed on. Well, back here, the gift has to go. I have to get rid of the gift. Um, there, the gift is now gone. There it goes. And what is left behind after the gift is gone is morality, and the morality has created this bonded together a uh, group of of um, a people. Okay, so there's the visualization. If 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 an eight year old could understand it, you can, right? So that's uh, the how of the gift. The how of the gift was represented there by the thread, and uh, you know it's the structure, not the content of the gift that matters, right? Okay, all right. So let's try to move on to another example. Um, the structure, not the content. The structure, not the content. Well, uh, you know, so so Mao's, um, you know, attributes the idea of the how to Robert Harris, um, again, who died in, um, in, in um, you know, this, so this article was published in 1909. So, God, he must have been just a kid uh, when this article was first published. Uh, the preeminence of the right hand. Okay, so this amazing article written by Harris before World War One makes the claim that right hands, most of us are right-handed, not because of nature, right? Instead, we're right-handed because right has been associated with might, basically, or with legitimate power, and, and that the right hand in many societies, or the right side, the polarity of the body, is linked to the fundamental polarities of the symbolic order. And his argument is, is that the polarity of the symbolic order penetrates all the way down into the human organism and that we're divided in half by, um, by the sacred and the profane, essentially, right? And so, so here's his claim. So he talks about how, how many societies uh, basically punish people who are left-handed, um, right? That you get you get uh, punished, you get hit, you get beaten maybe, uh, you get your hand tied down. He talks about the, the, the virtual mutilation of the uh, right hand, uh, excuse me, the left hand, subjected to veritable mutilation in order to keep children uh, from using. I know you probably can't read this. But his argument is, is that the right-left dichotomy is essentially mapped onto the sacred profane dichotomy. So the sacred is the thing set apart, the thing that is uh, socially, uh, um, it's part of the collective consciousness, right? God, uh, um, uh, and so on, power, might, right? And that the uh, profane are the things left behind. And his argument is that they tend to be associated with, um, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with more sinister things. I know I'm not doing a particularly good job, but he ultimately argues that, that left and right, um, are mapped onto the big, the really the core division that sets up the entire symbolic order, this distinction between the sacred and the profane. And that that is also mapped onto the male and the female, which is also mapped onto the strong and the weak. Sorry, uh, this is very patriarchal, sorry. Which is also ma mapped onto the active and the passive and life and death. So it's a bizarre claim here in some ways that this happens to be what's associated with right and that's with left. So his claim is, is that this dualistic structure of the symbolic order that has all of these paired polarities um, is mapped onto the human body and even into the hands. So that 
the right hand becomes associated with all of these positive things, with sacredness, with might, with maleness, with activity, with life, right, with strength. And that the left hand then becomes associated with other things, weakness and, and death and, and being a woman, kind of an odd thing, and, and the profane world in general, right? And so then he talks about, you know, in Islam and other places, um, there's a real sort of negative uh, connotation associated with the left hand. We still use the term sinister, which means left-handedness as a, as, a, as a double or a stand-in for, uh, for evil. So the signs of the body, the hands themselves, uh, are linked to this. The left hand is cursed, uh, right? The right hand is good, that kind of thing. He even talks about like the way that, um, yeah, that the way that, um, you know, soldiers uh, often hold the shield in the left hand. So I think, I think the way this goes, right, in societies that, that peace-loving societies that are defensive rather than aggressive, there's going to be a tendency to hold the shield, the defensive um, um, weapon in the right hand and the offensive weapon in the left hand that's in a peace-loving society but then in a warrior society it's going to be reversed that the left hand would hold the shield and the right hand would hold um you know the sword so the right hand which strikes which attacks um in in a, in a warrior society is the social hand that's the hand of power the hand of the collective the hand of the sacred the hand that strikes and accomplishes the ends of society whereas the left hand is the hand of the profane of the private of the person. So the left hand holds the shield protecting the private body of the warrior. The right hand holds the sword, which is the social collective weapon that's accomplishing, uh, you know, the defeat of the collective enemy, something along those lines. Miles writes in that essay that if you look at images of, um, of warriors, and even if you look at the a whole bunch of these images, so if you look at images of Moses, so Moses holds his staff in the right hand, so this is that famous um, moment of the uh, yeah of the brazen serpent, right, where the the serpents are attacking uh, um, uh, the the following of Moses, and so Moses puts up a uh, uh, a golden serpent, a brazen serpent, which causes all the other serpents to die. But he but he's animating that. If you can see, I just love this image, this old woodcut that uh, that there's power emanating from his staff, and which is probably being channeled in some way through the amulet of the of the uh, uh, of, 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 of the uh, of the brazen serpent but he's holding that staff in the right hand the right hand is the hand of power it's the right of collective it's the hand of the sacred it's the hand that links you to god right as a boy in the catholic church um whenever you would um um use the um um see so you would genuflect with your right knee right, when you would bend down, I think it was always the right knee, yeah, and then you would use your right hand uh, to uh, to bless yourself with holy water or to bless yourself with the sign of the cross, it was always the right hand, the sacred hand, um, right, okay, so here's Moses um, at, at Rafidim, right, uh, defeating the Amalek, I'm probably mispronouncing that, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, where they're holding up his arms, and as long as he holds his arms up, the uh, Israelis win. Um, and if his arms fall, the Amalek, uh, Amalek's win. But at any rate, there he is with his arms held up, but that staff, the sacred staff, is in the right hand, right? So the right is linked to the sacred, to power, to might, to warrior victory, and so on. And the left is a, a more private hand. Here's another image of Moses in the brazen, brazen serpent. Once again, the staff with this little amulet. I just love it. has got this little amulet at the top here. I just love this. Anyway, um, is, is, uh, is, again, held in the right hand of power. The right hand of power, the the hand that that Donald Trump swore on a Bible when uh, when 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 he was elected and so on, right? The hand of power that you would swear yourself in um, to a court of law or something, right? So this is Moses making water power again, using his right hand, waving his staff or wand uh, to make water sweet. Now um, I didn't believe this, but Hertz argues that in any depiction, medieval depiction of the Last Judgment. When Jesus sorts out, and you know, when when the dead rise, and you know, the trump of doom occurs, and uh, uh, the dead rise, and 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 Jesus sorts them out into the uh, the saved and the damned. Saved go to the right <laughs> of Jesus. They are right. They have followed right. They're righteous, and they're on their way uh, to heaven <laughs> as righteous people. I just love this. And the damned are on their way to 
hell. I didn't believe it, but I started looking up as many <laughs> images of uh, of the saved and the damned in, in uh, this is Peter Bruegel's famous uh, picture. This other one was from Lochner, from a 15th century image. And it's absolutely crystal clear that hell is on, hell's to the left, and uh, the righteous go to the right, uh, to heaven. And here it is again in, in Bruegel's uh, great image. Um, there's Jesus separating him out. The trumpet doom is sounding. Uh, the angels are escorting the uh, saved to heaven. The demons are escorting the damned uh, to what my daughter now calls the bad place. Anyway, um, so yeah, there's the Hellmouth. Um, if you've seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know all about the Hellmouth. And over here, again, we've got heaven. This must be a Catholic image because look at the percentage of people on their way to heaven. If this was a Calvinist image, it would be a mere trickle, right? And the great volume of masses would be going into that hellmouth uh, to eternal damnation. So at any rate, the righteous go to the right. So the right hand is linked to power. It's linked to the sacred. It's linked to masculinity. It's linked to, to action. It's linked to uh, strength. Uh, it's linked to military might and those kinds of things. All right, so the point of that long discourse is to show that even something that seems as naturalistic as handed right? Uh, the preference for right or left hand um, is in the end something that is structured by the symbolic order. And if you ever want to get a brief but incredibly powerful um, uh, illustration of structuralism and the principles of structuralism, right? That there's a symbolic structure out there and that symbolic structure is binding upon us, cuts right down to us, cuts right into our bodies, makes us often male and female in alignment with social structure, makes us um, right and left-handed even uh, in accordance with social structure, right? So handedness, even the polarity of the body is something that, again, that, that either emanates out into the symbolic order or that the big other of, of language and law actually comes in and reorganizes us at the very level of our hand, right? At which side we, we move and so on. So the body, gender, um, uh, right and wrong, uh, male and female, all these categories are symbolic categories that come from the structure of society, that these are not innate categories of nature, but they are symbolic categories of the social order, okay? That's structuralism. So it's the structure, not the content. It isn't the content of the gift. It's not the mere weight of the gift. It's not the value of the gift. It is the fact that there is a structure of exchange that goes on that binds a moral community together. And that is, in the end, what really matters. Okay. All right, so I think we've got most of, of this. Uh, so again, there's a moral economy going on here. Um, yeah, we've talked about the three gifts. We've talked about the obligation to give and receive. Um, yeah, uh, page 10, that power and authority follow, I'm sorry, my handwriting, these are, these are my actual lecture notes. So power and authority follow the gift uh, that there's a bond created by things in that are, yeah. And it, so it, you create a fetish relationship. Gifts, the how of the gift that can sicken and kill people is a fetishized relationship. In the end, it isn't going to be the spirit of the gift that's killing people. It's going to be the other people are going to treat the person who violates the spirit of the gift poorly. So it's experienced in spiritual terms, but in the real, um, it's taken care of by the bodies, minds, and actions of social uh, members of the social group. So the gift provides a, real a way to realize the social relationship. It provides a way to think about the social relationship. It provides a kind of avatar um, for grasping and manipulating the social relationship, but it isn't the social relationship. So the content of the gift goes away, leaving behind the bond. So the gift then is a fetish object in Marx's terms. What does that mean? It means it's a material object. In our example, it was that little pink um, uh, roller skate um, that uh, seems to vibrate with power, right? And it's handed from person to person, and it seems to have a spirit inside of it. And if that gift isn't given on with worthy return, then you're going to get the spirit of the gift is going to attack. That's a fetish object. It's an object, an everyday object that seems infused with spiritual powers. So in the terms of Marx and the terms of Mao's, you wind up with a fetish object is, is something in which it's a thing 
that seems to have a kind of magic or mystical relationship to other things that is in fact a bond between person, persons that is realized or represented or graspable uh, through the transfer of a thing. Okay. All right. Yeah, so 13 to 14 again, the, that we talked about the, the special form of the gift and the sacrifice. Yeah, page 15, almsgiving and generosity. I had some pictures of that too that I thought would be kind of worthwhile. Yeah, so here's sacrifice. So, um, yeah, so, so you know, um, yeah, so these are all sort of Old Testament images of sacrifice. Actually, that is a, that's a translation image. Try this one. Um, I think this is, um, this is from Exodus, where you're actually, you know, the, the burnt offering on the altar. You feed the God by taking your first fruits or, or some other uh, uh, valued thing that has value, it always has to have value in it, right? Remember, if you're going to sacrifice to a social god, the thing sacrificed has to have society in it. So as Robertson Smith says, you don't sacrifice wild animals, nor you, and you don't sacrifice weeds. You sacrifice crops that have labor embedded in them, and you sacrifice domestic animals that have labor embedded in them. In fact, it has to have value to have worth, life inside of them and so to make a worthy return or to even make a worthy offering it has to have life in it right so there's a burnt offering you burn it that's what to make sacred is is you're actually putting it into a form you're consuming it putting it in a form where god can eat it because god is spirit by burning you're creating a spirit food for the god and so that's taking place here and at the same time you're you're asking you're making a prayer at the same time so you're giving a gift making it a prayer at the same time that God has an obligation to receive and then an obligation to return, uh, to make a worthy return by answering the prayer. That would be the idea, right? Here's another image of it, this time with a, um, uh, a bull uh, being uh, sacrificed. Again, this is, you know, a very, you know, you know, the Old Testament is full of these very careful measurements for, for, a, for an altar. An altar is simply a place of sacrifice, a place for burnt uh, offering. So, so again, here goes the, you're feeding the God by burning up a valued social object. There's, the, there's labor embedded in that thing. That's not just a, a, a deer you shot, right? This is a bull that has labor in it and it's being burned. It has, has value. And then the prayers are going up at the same time. So you're making a gift to the God who has an obligation to receive it. And then the prayer indicates what a worthy return would look like. You want your prayers answered, so there it is. You're obliging the God to answer your prayers by making a sacrifice. Here's another image um, of the altar of burnt offering with the prayers that go on at the same time. Okay, so there it is. So this is, you know, this is Miles' book on prayer. It's his book on sacrifice, um, and it's it's mentioned here in his book on the gift. So So religion then often involves this kind of anticipatory um, binding of the God by giving, making an offering, a gift, accompanied with a indication of what would be worth -y to you as a member of a congregation, right? What would be a worthy return? So here's your gift. It's on your back, God. Give me something back. And again, not your God. Your God works. This is simply a way other gods work, right? So we in sociology always have to deal with other people's gods, never our own. So this is a way that other people's gods function. Uh, again, yours actually works. Okay, yeah. Here and here's the famous moment of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. Again, we have the the sticks there. They're going to light the fire very soon. Here, they're going to be burning old Isaac's head up, and and making again a, an offering, a burnt offering uh, to God. And of course, the angel uh, comes in. Who's the angel here? I think the angel is a. Uh, is it Michael? Is it is it named? I'm not sure the angel's name. Gabriel? Can't remember. Anyway, coming in, grabbing that sword, keeping Abraham from. Um, uh, killing his kid. But again, the, the goal here, again, is the obligation for worthy return. That might have been a little bit uh, odd in that particular instance. Okay. All right. So then, um, yeah, so there's all kind of, chapter two is all about gener uh, generosity, um, honor, money, that, uh, that there's all kinds of, of complex relationships that are realized through gift giving. Um, I think we've already hit most of this stuff. Yeah, page 21, you have to have a formal disdain of gift. Gifts often, when they're given, have to be, like, thrown on the ground. They can't be treated as though they're really, you know, something of value. You have to kind of, you know, discount and throw them around. Arm shells, necklaces as ritual objects are, um, yeah, are, are, 
yeah, used for, yeah, or hoarded and used for healing. Wealth and treasure is money. Yeah, so money actually initially was a kind of gift or something that was involved in the circulation of valuables. Um, so money is something uh, that comes up. The, partic the particularities of ownership. Oh, yeah. So there's a section in here about like um, that the spirit of the owner and the spirit of the producer often winds up embedded in the gift. It becomes part of the how of the gift. This is very linked to marks on value and commodities. So, uh, so that these are kind of magic qualities that get associated with the gift. He writes about people like like slapping the backside or slapping their cows or uh, you know or kicking their dog if you're trading your dog or selling your dog in order to break that kind of magic bond the how that linked together the owner with the object right the spell is broken in such a way. He writes about gendered objects. He writes about all kinds of ways that 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 marriage and exchange of of, of goods and gifts goes along with the exchange of women and marriage itself is actually not a, a, a purchase. Marriage is generally an exchange of gift. It's usually a moral relationship in that way. Um, again, even even in some of these really simple systems. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here pretty much, right? Yeah. So the wife price, the bride price is talked about. You know, chapter three is where he begins to make the move into modern law. And he's going to claim that the gift is really the initial form of contract. It, he basically argues that this is a mechanism for making a society solid, and even once it's developed a kind of, of, of nascent um, system of, of organic solidarity, in other words, once you've got actually like divisions of labor and different tribes specializing in different ways, that these societies are being bonded together, the segments are being stitched together uh, through, uh, through gift exchange, right? So in general, uh, and you know, this is a drawing that's in the back of my book. We'll just look at it. Um, Durkheim's theory in the division of labor is that mechanically bonded societies can't touch each other because if they do, they'll generate sacrilege, unpunished, sacred law being broken, taboos being broken that will require social response. And so you don't have any solidarity. But here, these gift exchange systems, these systems of total prestation or a, a system of... Um, a potlatch essentially creates chains of obligations that bind together segments into a larger society. So you get a division of labor and a kind of binding solidarity without the contractual relations of organic solidarity. However, these wind up becoming, you know, quasi or proto, uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, contracts. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. There's more in there uh, about the pledge and so on. Um, yeah, um, do I need to go on about this? You know, he distinguishes between, uh, you know, the house things that have value and the things in the field that don't and how, um, things in the house wind up having honor attached to them. Um, and so they wind up in a kind of, um, you know, that because of the sacredness attached to these things that they must be, um, that when defetishized, they have to be part of a gift, uh, structure Whereas the things of the field, money, cattle, money, pecunia, um, are, 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 are t simply temporary personal property. They don't really have your spirit inside of them. They simply are temporarily held and they can be exchanged on markets. Remember that market small a, but that all of the things of the house, the familia, can only be exchanged in markets big A, that kind of thing, right? Okay, so I could go into more detail about that, but I won't. But I think I think you've got the gist of it here, right? So again, an excellent book, covers a lot of territory very quickly. Um, um, again, it, I've always said that Mao's gift meets my envy test. It is a book I, I, I would be extraordinarily proud to have written um, and much in it. So, so the good parts of this book, he essentially outlines a kind of moral order that would, um, that, was in existence before capitalism, a kind of moral object that was traded in exchange between people, an economy that was rooted in morality, an exchange of ritual objects instead of being uh, rooted in value and the exchange of commodities. In other words, you have a really a, a kind of fully developed social system. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, the idea here is that um, so in my article I wrote with Mark World called Atopia Awaits, you know, we argued that, that look, once capitalism ends, um, you know, Mao's book essentially outlines another world. So 
once you get rid of markets big or petty odd, you get rid of like so so let's imagine that you actually have a communist revolution capitalism is shot down you no longer have a commodity exchange you can still and will still have the exchange of moral ob objects so there's still going to be um, a kind of economy and a moral economy that's going to transcend the end of capital now there's more to the argument here than that but um, but yeah, the argument is that a world awash with use values may be forever free from value in a commodity form, but it is never going to be free from values. Not value, but values, right? In the form of moral and ritual objects in circulation. So the gift form or the sacrifice form are two forms of values, right? Commodities are the form of value, commodity, money, and capital. So no society has yet existed or could exist, right? And still retain that name that did not vibrate with collective effervescence and no society has yet existed that did not then amplify that collective, um, that collective effervescence and rituals and then to uh, essentially alienate, right? The produced surplus energy and project it into or onto or bind it in some way uh, to a fetishized moral object. In other words, they create something like gifts or moral objects of some kind, gifts, totems um, and the like. So societies vibrate, that's what they do, right? And those waves are tuned by gifts or sacrifice long after they are no longer tuned by commodities. So the vibrations of, the, of our time, the, the moral vibrations of human beings, human subjects in capitalism, tuned by value, according to capital, or excuse me, according to Marx. But in our, in a post-capital world, you, I, I think if we don't think this through, our world would still be vibrating and that moral energy would then be organized again quite readily by gifts or sacrifices, something like that. So this is a problem that one had to think about and that's what we tried to do here in, in this piece. So we used Mao's, um, um, you know, um, great book on the gift and the moral economy rooted in gift giving as a mechanism for um, thinking through what a post-capitalist society would look like and you know try to sort of prompt Marxists to think a little bit differently about um, about what communism would be. Okay so with that we'll wind it up. I hope you found this useful.